in just a minute, I have a, one important, two important announcements. Cell phones, turn them off, please. Feedback forms, the lucky people that found them in their seat, please fill them out. They are so important to the program committee. And now uh, we have Dorothy Lovering is our uh, publicity chairman, chairperson, and she wants to say uh, a few words. One of the things that publicity is doing is making sure that our brochures are out in the libraries, the retirement centers, and the senior centers where we send them out. So if any of you are interested in doing that for us, just go in and check them to make sure that they still have them and that we even resupply them, that'd be great. We've got quite a few volunteers locally, but if you live out from Burlington, South Burlington, or Lucy, Wilson, that would be helpful. Thanks. Just come and see me. I'll be up at the membership uh, table afterwards. Thank you. And now Michael will introduce the speaker. Thank you, Betsy. Good afternoon. Today I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Colin Maine. He's the news editor at VT Digger, an influential statewide news and public policy website. And also to welcome his wife, Sue Kim, thank you for joining us. Colin grew up in Topsom, Maine. He earned his undergraduate degree from the Dill School of Journalism at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Colin has spent most of his career, far from Maine, in Cambodia. He was a reporter and editor at two English language newspapers, the Cambodia Daily and the Phnom Penh Post, and also an editor at Southeast Asia Globe, a regional current affairs magazine. Fortunately for us, Colin recently returned to New England and took up a key position earlier this year at VT Digger. Today, he will be sharing some insights with us on such issues as real news, disinformation, investigative reporting, and the challenges and opportunities facing journalists in Vermont and perhaps beyond. This is his first visit to Triple E. Please join me in giving a very warm Triple E welcome to Colin May. Good afternoon. So, can you hear me in this, or should I talk in the microphone? Yeah? All right, great. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot for being here, and sorry to take you away from the vote on the Kavanaugh hearings. <laughs> Maybe we can get some live updates into the presentation. Let's see. Um, yeah, so I was, as, as far as what I'm sort of going to talk about, you know, all I, uh, this was basically the title that was sent to me in the speech. It's, it's quite a title, as you can see. Uh, how the disappearance of real news has led to mis disinformation, mistrust, rigid thinking in our democracy instead of shared values and real problem solving. Uh, so this is like a pretty huge question we're facing in the media, a pretty huge question we're facing in society, obviously. Um, so I'm going to sort of start on a national level. Uh, and sort of what's going on there, even a global level, and then sort of work our way into Vermont, and then I'll talk a bit about what's going on at BT Digger, and hopefully we'll have like uh, 20 minutes or so to take questions and talk about whatever, whatever I didn't cover in this presentation. Um, and I'd like to say before I get started that Ann Galloway, our founder and editor, uh, who you may know of, uh, she's very sorry she couldn't make it. She's in Texas this week at a Trip Fest, which is hosted by the Texas Tribune, uh, which is one of the most successful nonprofit news organizations in the country, uh, started by a guy named John Thornton, who invited Ann to go down there and sort of talk <coughs> about some of the bigger ideas of what's going on with nonprofit news uh, and how we can expand what we're doing at BT Digger, both in Vermont and elsewhere. So she's sorry she couldn't make it, but she's uh, fighting the good fight in Texas at the moment. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm going to sort of break it down one thing at a time. Uh, first, the disappearance of real news. Um, obviously, you know, at VT Digger, we very much do not believe the real news is gone altogether, right? I mean, <laughs> we're, 
we're, we're trying to make real news happen every day. Um, but certainly the amount of real news being generated at a local level is seriously diminished uh, compared to even what it was two decades ago. So, you know, just some of the basic figures that the amount of money going into print outlets through ad revenue just from 2000 to 2015 has gone down from $6 billion across the country to $20 billion across the country. So we're operating on a third of the budget that we were just 20 years ago. Um, and from 1990 to 2016, uh, the number, total number of people employed at these organizations has gone down from almost half a million people to 173,000. Uh, and the number of daily newspapers has also seen a precipitous decline, although not as significantly. I think that it's important to note the number has gone down from 14 and a half to 12 and a half thousand, but the actual, those organizations are far less robust uh, than they were in the past. And, get into in a bit some of the bigger Vermont news organizations, the extent to which they've been gutted. They still exist, but they exist in a far, far diminished way. Um, and then talking a bit about news deserts. So, uh, you know, you may be familiar with the term. This is places where basically there just are no journalists covering what's happening in these places, right? So, I mean, I think that you can think around Vermont. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Um, around Vermont, you know, a lot of places that once had strong coverage. Um, so, you know, a lot of jobs, even the jobs that do exist, have shifted from local places, from, you know, sort of uh, blanket coverage in the United States to pockets uh, in the East Coast and the West Coast, right? So areas around New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles um, that still have very strong coverage. So this is sort of... As things have shifted from print to digital, the jobs available in digital media are very much focused on the sort of urban centers. Um, so just a few stats, sort of the number of jobs in internet uh, publishing has gone up from 77,000 in 2008 to more than 200,000 in 2017. Um, but 73% of those jobs are concentrated in these areas. And then this sort of shows you know, where you see the darker colors down in Southern California, uh, around Chicago, uh, Illinois, and in New York, uh, a little bit in Florida. Those are places where lots of journalism jobs, lots of coverage, very robust. Uh, you know, obviously, if you look here in Vermont, you see a much, a much lighter shade, um, which would suggest there's just not a lot of folks doing journalism here. Um, and particularly, uh, you know, interestingly, sort of central Vermont is the lightest color, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, I, I think that, you know, things like the Caledonia Record, the Brattleboro Reformer, that those sort of give a slightly brighter hue to some of the other uh, parts of the state. Um, and then a bit about fake news, which obviously has become, <laughs> we've got some thumbs down in the audience. Uh, um, and, you know, fake news has become this very broad term. You know, at some point it might have actually meant things that were intentionally fake. It's come to mean something, a lot of different things. It's often used to describe news that people don't like, such as the Russia reports. Um, you know, this sort of clickbait, which is maybe sort of true in some way, but is meant purely to bring as many people onto the website as possible, so it has very little value. Um, and then actual fabricated news, such as Katy Perry resolving the ISIS conflict. <laughs> so, you know, there, it, it's sort of a broad, a broad swath of things as far as what means fake news. Um, but, you know, when we talk about, and I think it's important to talk about fighting all these things separately, but to see each of them as being a separate problem in themselves, right? That fake news, actual fabricated news is its own problem. Clickbait is something that sort of the internet business model has driven just to try to get as many people on your website as possible, and news people don't like, that's obviously another issue. And then just a bit about another thing is fake news is not news that are mistakes, right? We make mistakes. Does this work? Yeah. Um, oh, it's a pointer. Uh, <laughs> this, this newfangled technology. <laughs> Um, and, and then mistakes also not to be confused with fake news, right? That news organizations get things wrong, and sometimes when you get things wrong, it's a huge liability for the news organization. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the New York Times story recently about 
Uh, Nikki Haley's curtains cost $52,000. Um, she didn't make the decision to buy the curtains. The Trump administration didn't make the decision to buy the curtains. So it was sort of framed, framed in a way that made the Trump administration look very bad. It was actually a decision made by the Obama administration, and a lot of conservative pundits took the New York Times to task and said this is proof of their liberal bias. So you know, mistakes sometimes maybe they're not well or not they're well intentioned, badly intentioned. They blow up on the news organization and they fuel this sort of fake news narrative. Uh, and this isn't new, right? So Jonathan Swift said uh, a few hundred years ago, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. Um, and, and this is proven very much true in the social media age. Uh, the, a study that was published in Science Magazine found that falsehood uh, diffuses significantly faster, farther, deeper, and more broadly than the truth. And on Twitter alone, falsehoods tend to spread 70% faster than uh, truths. Um, and that it's not just robots that are doing this. There's an idea that these sort of algorithms that are generated by the social media sites are somehow responsible for spreading this fake news. And it's actually us that are responsible for fake news. Um, there's you know, various theories on why that is, but that humans are the ones who are spreading this news and not the bots most of the time. Uh, and one solution to all this, and this goes, this is less about fake news than it is about what I was talking about with the news deserts and that sort of thing, um, but that the advertising model is, it's becoming very clear that it's broken, right? The New York Times, the Washington Post, you know, who have millions and millions of readers a day, they can generate enough money to actually have a sort of a standard funding uh, model for their news organizations. For local news, that's just not possible anymore. It's very clear that if you know people who are still sticking to the advertising model, they can hire a few reporters, a few editors, but they're really struggling to get by. And what Ann Galloway did a few years ago, uh, after being laid off from one of those newspapers, from the Times Argus, is start a website and try a whole different model for how local news can be done. Um, and it's not just happening at BT Digger; it's happening across the country, like I said, Anne's at the Texas Tribune right now, they're doing it about as well as anyone are. Uh, there's Mississippi Today, there's uh, a website in Connecticut, there's a few in California. Um, so this is, the idea is starting to spread a bit. Uh, and there's organizations like Institute for, for Nonprofit News, which brings together, I think they have 140 members around the country who are talking about ways to do membership models of journalism so that the readers are essentially paying for uh, as much as possible the content that they're reading, right? So you have a much more direct connection and you no longer rely on advertising. Uh, Lion Publishers is the same thing. That's local, independent, online news. They also have hundreds of members. Um, Newsmatch is an organization that uh, gives matches local donations so that it uh, sort of helps fund these operations. And as I mentioned, uh, TribFest is this I would encourage you to check out the Texas Tribune. They're doing some pretty cool work. Um, so, you know, rather than just talking about how uh, how bad things are out there, you know, Anne talks about going to conferences around the country and journalism and just how depressing the experience is. That everyone's saying everything we knew is gone and the end of news is near. But that that doesn't have to be the case, right? That we're there are people who are actively coming up with ways to fill some of these news deserts. There's a thing, I believe it's called News Corps, that's sort of like AmeriCorps, where you hire young journalists and send them around the country to some of these places that don't have uh, reporters. So, you know, people, we, BT Digger, are part of a broader effort to actually fill these news deserts and create a model that's more sustainable um, than this. And then a few of the ways, uh, so as I mentioned, it's a membership model largely. Uh, I'll get in later to sort of how VT Digger is funded, um, but you know the idea is that people are moving towards a system where if you want the news, you pay for it, and you don't pay a rate necessarily. You pay as much as you can afford, and you know the NPR affiliates really, I think, are the standard bearers of this model. They did it decades before anyone else did it. So VT Digger is not reinventing the wheel here. A lot of what we're doing is very similar to what BPR or other NPR affiliates does, which is they say, if you appreciate this programming, 
if you appreciate the work we're doing, then help support us. Um, and it's also mission driven. So unlike clickbait that we were talking about before, you don't need to put out the news that's going to, you know, you don't need to put out Half Naked Woman, you don't need to put out this kind of thing, that you're doing stories that are part of a broader mission. So, uh, you know, at BT Digger, we're doing um, government accountability work, we're doing, uh, obviously, democracy, uh, environment, I mean, all the things that you see on our website, that this is part of a broader mission to contribute uh, to important public dialogue. Um, and you know, most importantly, it's sustainable, that we're not relying on advertisers uh, to continue taking out ads in BT Digger, that we have a membership base who appreciates what we're doing and will keep supporting. Um, this is not all gonna be a pitch for BT Digger, by the way. Most of it, <laughs> most of it is more broadly focused. Uh, so back to the title, you know, talked about disinformation and now mistrust and rigid thinking. Um, so the Pew Research Center just did a general study into people's opinions about their government, and it was pretty depressing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, 18% um, of Americans trust their government to do the right thing most or all the time. Uh, in 1968, that number was 62%, and even during Watergate, the number was 36%. Um, so. It's a pretty uh, dire situation. Um, and this sort of helps explain why there's so little <laughs> trust in the media right now. Um, so this shows from left to right, liberal leaning media to right leaning media. Uh, and this, this variations on this are sort of kicking around the internet. Uh, I don't really want to get into the methodology that they used or whether or not um, sites that they call are neutral or not, but I think it helps explain the general sense that there's not a lot of this sort of uh, partisan divide in the media at the moment, right? But you see up down the middle you have NPR, BBC, Washington Post, uh, New York Times. Obviously some people, including our president, would disagree with whether they're uh, playing things down the middle. Um, but it's hard as a news organization right now to not be seen as, you know, when there's such a partisan divide, so many people are distrustful of the government, then how does the media sort of be trusted? Um, what, what is the vertical? Uh, uh, this is clickbait down at the bottom. So websites that are just generally uh, trying to get as many people onto the website as possible. Sensational and clickbait is what it says down here. And then up here is complex, so more like intellectual news outlets, uh, The Atlantic, The Economist, things like this. Um, so you see CNN sort of plays it down the middle, but is panders a bit more. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the, the idea of this graphic. And I'm sure that many different people using many different methodologies would place different news organizations in different places on this. Um, but just to give a general sense of the sort of how the media is caught up in a lot of the partisan at least the perceptions uh, of how things are. I was talking to one of our reporters who said this weekend, someone came up to them and said, so where does BT Digger fall on the political spectrum? And she was trying to say, we don't, right? That we're reporting the news, we're reporting you know, both sides of the story to the extent that they are sort of uh, legitimate and have something to contribute to the conversation. Um, but there's sort of a sense that news organizations wield the political stick in the same way that uh, others do. And you know, part of the problem is that a lot of news organizations do try to do that, right? Um, obviously Fox News and MSNBC and these organizations have their own um, agendas, I guess. Uh, so what to do about all this? Um, well, there's sort of a reactive approach. I just took the example of Indonesia's government, which is gonna start having weekly press conferences where they inform the people about what fake news is. Um, you can see how this would be pretty easily abused, obviously, when they start. I mean, you know, uh, leaders tend to have different views of what's true and not true than journalists and that sort of thing. Um, you know, obviously there's a more extreme reactive approach, which is that if leaders or uh, people don't like the news, then, you know, you can put people in jail. There are lawsuits. In Cambodia, where I was uh, reporting for a long time, you know, near the end of my time there, 
the government was cracking down quite a bit and you know some journalists ended up in jail. Uh, so the reactive approach from governments can be extreme or it can be just having news conferences to try to clear things up. Um, and then there's a more <coughs> proactive approach to how to deal with fake news, which is to teach people how to read the news, right? That to not take it for granted that people, young people, uh, middle-aged people, older people will be able to differentiate when they're looking at Facebook, when they're looking at Twitter, when they're online, what's real and what's not, right? What can be trusted, what can't be trusted. So to take news literacy as another skill that you need in order to engage in civil debate, uh, in order to be a sort of functioning citizen, um, you know, and someone who's sort of been pushing this quite a bit in recent years is our governor in Vermont, Bill Scott, um, who, you know, in April when he stood up and signed those gun laws, he made sort of a surprising and impassioned plea for people to be more decent, right? To try to sort of, that the, the level of dialogue happening online in particular was just a, in such a way that no one was even having a conversation anymore. People were just yelling at each other, insulting each other, and it wasn't really getting us anywhere. Um, so I think that he deserves some credit for, you know, uh, at least raising this issue and talking about it. He wrote an uh, op-ed on, wrote an opinion piece in BT Digger recently. Um, you know, I don't know that he's come forward with any particularly innovative ideas for how to integrate this into school curriculums or anything like that, but perhaps that's uh, to come. All right, so now I'm going to shift the talk to Vermont a bit. Well, for the rest of it. Um, here's our team at VT Digger. Um, it's changed a bit since this photo was taken, but uh, just to briefly give you a sense, we have um, environment reporters. This is Anne, by the way. Um, we have a web editor, uh, Mike Doherty, uh, a columnist, John Margolis, um, and then a number of beat reporters over here. Uh, criminal justice, healthcare, politics, energy, environment. This is Jim Welsh, who was a former editor at the Burlington Free Press, who's now our uh, special projects editor. Um, yeah, so we have about 20 people on staff when we're full. We have a couple of positions that we're hiring for right now, uh, just to give you a sense of that. And. There's sort of an anecdote that I think helps explain how much things have changed in the moment right now in Vermont media now compared to 20 years ago uh, and sort of the role that VT Digger is trying to play in Vermont media. Um, when the State House was adjourned this last year uh, and everyone was sort of on a deadline, this is, it's been compared among political journalists to like the Super Bowl, it is the final negotiations you know, it's been four months in the State House. This year it was almost six months in the State House. And this is sort of the big push at the end. Uh, it goes until midnight, you know, hard negotiations, backdoor negotiations, grandstanding on the State House floor. Um, and this year at the State House adjournment, there were three news organizations there. Uh, Seven Days had one journalist. Uh, NBC5 had one journalist there. And VT Digger had five journalists there. Um, <laughs> So I think that, that sort of gives a sense of, you know, that we're a mission-driven news organization that sends all of our, whatever available resources we have, we send them to cover state politics. And I think that for a lot of other news organizations that don't have a lot of reporters, it just ends up sort of falling, it doesn't become a priority, right? You have to, for TV stations, they have to cover crime, they have to sort of cover your classic TV news. Um, so when you have three or four reporters, you just don't have the resources to really give state politics the coverage that it requires. Um, and just as sort of an example of this, uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about the Rutland Herald and the Burlington Free Press. The Rutland Herald, are, their news editor for 15 years, his name was Alan Keyes. Um, he now works at VT Digger. The reason he left the Rutland Herald was because they were in deep, deep financial troubles, and as the news editor, he felt like it was his responsibility to report on that, um, and the publishers weren't very happy about his reporting, <laughs> and he was shown the door after 15 years. Uh, and Ann Galloway, as soon as she found out about it, she called him and hired him. Um, so he's our criminal justice reporter now. But when he showed up at the Rutland Herald, they had 
uh, a three-person State Press Bureau in Montpelier. They had a four-person Southern Vermont Bureau, and that's not including Rutland, that's the rest of Southern Vermont. They had six people covering Rutland City. They had one person in Bennington. They had a Sunday reporter who just wrote for the Sunday newspaper. Uh, they had a number of freelancers and stringers. They had an art section, they had a business section, each with dedicated reporters. Um, and then they had nine to 10 editors, they had two city editors, they had a managing editor, an assistant managing editor, an arts editor. Uh, so that's 1995, and now 23 years later, they have no press bureau, they have no Southern Vermont Bureau, they have no Sunday newspaper, they have four reporters, period, four news reporters, and two editors, although one of them was just let go, so currently they have one editor. So, Again, like the comparison is just remarkable. You know, they had almost, they had more than 20 reporters, they had nine to 10 editors, now they have four reporters and two editors, mm -hmm. right? So that just gives you a sense of, when you saw that number early in the presentation about how many newspapers still exist, you know, they may exist, they may publish, but it's in a way that is, you know, just the amount of work they're doing is almost uh, incomparable. Um, and then the Burlington Free Press, which still puts out, Decent paper some days. Uh, in 1990, they had 48 uh, full time editors, reporters, photographers, and photo editors. Um, they had a four person State House Bureau. I apologize for the misspelling there. Um, they had correspondents in uh, 10 out of the state's 14 counties. So these weren't staff members, these were correspondents who wrote pretty regularly, wrote about uh, city halls, wrote about you know, news in those counties. So that's separate from the 48 full-time editors. That's another uh, 10 people in counties around the state. And they had a Sunday circulation of about 70,000 newspapers. Uh, in 2018, they have 12 editors, reporters. They have one person who's both a photographer and a videographer. Um, they have no correspondence around the state. And they have a Sunday circulation of 11,000 newspapers. So that's compared to 70,000. Um, so you know, I, th I think that when you get down to how what's actually happening in these newsrooms, you really get a sense of even where the newspaper is still coming out, um, it, it's a very different operation indeed. Uh, and you know, Vermont still has a number of dailies, the Caledonia Record, Valley News, uh, which is both New Hampshire and Vermont, the Times Argus, the Bennington Banner, Brattleboro Reformer. Um, Valley News, Bennington Banner, and Brattleboro Reformer all are all partners at BT Digger, which means that we share content with them, uh, we share some coverage with them, we share reporters with them in a couple of cases. Um, so they're all publishing still, uh, but again, they, on a smaller scale than the Rutland Herald and the Burlington Free Press, uh, have had their newsrooms gutted as well. And actually, a number of our reporters previously worked at these newspapers, but amid downsizing, uh, needed another job. And then there's Beachy Digger, uh, le led by journalists and powered by the public. Um, in 2009, Anne was the only employee. Uh, people at the State House recall her with her computer, uh, and that was Beachy Digger, Anne Galloway with her computer in the State House. Um, she had no budget, and then she got a grant from the Knight Foundation that kind of kick-started it as something a bit bigger than she is, allowed her to hire someone to start actually looking at how to turn it into a business. Um, today we have 20 staff uh, and an annual budget of $1.5 million. Uh, and our main competitors are not the newspapers. Burlington Free Press continues to be quite competitive on a statewide scale, um, but otherwise we think of Seven Days and VPR as being sort of our main competition. Uh, seven Days, they have about three dedicated reporters who do a lot of daily news coverage, politics news coverage. Um, they scoop us, we scoop them. It's a healthy competition. Uh, we hit them, they hit us, etc. Uh, BPR, you know, they do radio very well, obviously, but they also have their reporters uh, do stories online. So if you go to vpr.org, you can find longer versions of what they're putting on the radio that are, are proper news reports. You know, they talk to lots of sources. Essentially, they're trying to do the same kind of thing we are but not the traditional newspapers. So it's a very, a very different media environment. Um, and just a bit about sort of how BT Digger operates here. Um, so we're online only, and I, I think one of the most important parts of that is that 
our business model doesn't include uh, tens of thousands of dollars every month on printing a newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. It's very, very expensive. So we've sort of, by cutting that out of the equation, almost all of BT Digger's money is going towards um, people, people and reporters, uh, business staff, et cetera. Um, and obviously more readers are moving online too, so uh, it makes sense to go where the readers are. Um, this talks a bit about uh, who our readership is. Um, so as far as ages go, more than half our readers are between 55 and 74. Um, about 10% between 18 and 34. Uh, education level, um, majority, 86%, have a college degree or higher. Uh, income level, uh, about 70% earn over $60,000 a year. And the other <coughs> metric that we have in our media kit is how many of our readers vote on a regular basis. And as you can see, a very slim part of our readership is uh, not voting. So the idea there is just to show that our readers are engaged. Um, and then this just talks a bit about our reach. Uh, you know, talked about some of the, the biggest newspaper in the state, Burlington Free Press, is distributed to 11,000 people on a Sunday. Um, so you know, we're getting uh, online <coughs> reaching every month almost a quarter of a million unique readers, um, monthly page views almost a million, and that number is steadily going up, although probably not a huge amount of going up to do, right? Vermont's not a huge place. The amount of interest in nitty gritty Vermont news outside of Vermont is not huge. Um, so, you know, it's not the kind of operation that can sort of scale up forever, but we're getting to a point where, you know, we're, we're getting a significant number uh, of people in the state reading BT Digger. Um, and then talking a bit about the sort of coverage we do, we have about 12 reporters who are broken up between beats, bureaus, and partnerships. Uh, beats are reporters who are focused on, uh, we have healthcare, criminal justice, politics, uh, environment, um, and others probably. We have a Burlington reporter as well. We have an education reporter. Um, so sort of the classic news beats, and then we have uh, some partnerships with the Brattleboro Reformer, the Bennington Banner, where we share reporters with them. So those reporters are reporting in those places, but they're trying to report stories that are of statewide interest to people who might be reading BT Digger. Um, and we do a mix of news and investigation. So one thing that Ann has talked about, uh, about when she started is she was doing about three stories a week. Um, and really deep stories, uh, you know, very insightful, groundbreaking, etc. But there just wasn't enough stories going up to bring people back on a regular basis, right? So we tried to strike a balance sort of between the daily news grind, um, which is just covering what's going on on a given day, uh, and then deeper investigations, which is really, you know, where we think we deliver the most value. But in order for people to get constant value out of the news, uh, that we're creating in order for them to come back on a day-to-day -day basis, in order for them to deliver value to the underwriters. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of news that we have to create. So I'm the news editor, and I'm always like pushing people to report what's going on that day. You know, we try to reach, we try to do eight to 10 stories a day, uh, which between 10 to 12 reporters is, you know, we're busy. Um, <laughs> but also trying to balance that with investigation. So trying to give people time to really dive into issues, um, to you know, pour over documents, to do interviews on the record, off the record, just to try to find out about things that other people aren't reporting on. Um, we've started doing more podcasts and videos. Uh, our podcasts, our sort of flagship podcast is called The Deeper Dig, um, and that's produced by Mike Doherty, who is our community editor. Um, and he, uh, he does a pretty fantastic job. Uh, if you're into radio, into podcasts, I would certainly encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's a weekly podcast where he, for an hour, ex sort of explores one of the bigger stories of the week, but sort of talks to some of the people who are part of that story. He talks to the reporter who's been reporting it, 
and sort of go behind the story and find out about uh, what's going on in a way that you wouldn't uh, in a news story. And then we've been doing videos as well. Things like today there was um, outside Bernie Sanders' office, there was a rally against Brett Kavanaugh. So things that sort of people might want to see but couldn't turn out for uh, would be the kinds of things that we might try to do a video for. And money. Uh, still important, even for a nonprofit news organization. Um, so this is from this is a, a year old, I apologize, but it's the freshest one that I could find. Um, it sort of shows the breakdown in our uh, revenue. About a third of our revenue comes from grants. So that's from organizations like the Knight Foundation, uh, Neiman, uh, people, you know, national organizations who support uh, local news operations, oftentimes through a donor, donor match. So if you visit our website, um, we, twice a year we do fundraising campaigns and oftentimes we'll do news matches. So whatever we can raise ourselves will be matched by a group like the Knight Foundation. Um, underwriting is about a third, so that's a fairly classic advertising model where we're reaching out to companies. Right now we're reaching out to political candidates to try to get them to advertise on our website. Um, so pretty much anyone who has advertising that they want to place, convincing them that Beachy Digger is the place that they want to do that. Um, contributions, so this is the membership model coming from individuals, coming from um, pretty much anyone who you know, the pitch here is if you believe in what we're doing, then support what we're doing. Right? And news revenue, that's coming from our partners, the Brattleboro Reformer, the Bennington Banner that I talked about. And then we have about 20 other weekly newspapers around the state who use our stories for their sort of statewide coverage. Um, so uh, <coughs> places like the um, Colchester newspaper and uh, just a lot of sort of smaller community papers who still want to have some statewide coverage. Um, and events, 1%, uh, not a huge amount coming from events. And then expenses, as you can see, 81% is going towards program expenses. So that's essentially staff, staffing costs. So 80% of what we make is going towards that. Um, we spend about 16% on fundraising and 3% on general administration. So. A huge amount of what we make is going into the people who make it, which makes it a very lean operation uh, and different from a lot of legacy organizations who are spending a ton. Uh, and then a few things about what we're working towards. Um, a, a partnership with UVM, uh, which is working with them uh, to set up journalism classes uh, and to train uh, journalists, hopefully, who will then stay in Vermont. Right? I think that's very important to us. Um, radio news briefs, uh, this is a syndication that we've started doing last month with WDEV, and we'll start doing with VPR, where we uh, send them the news that we're working on today so that they can broadcast it in the afternoon. Uh, as sort of similar to an AP relationship, uh, the AP is sort of on the decline, uh, at least in their Vermont coverage, so sort of trying to step into that void and uh, give radio stations some fresh news for the uh, afternoon primetime drive. Uh, PolitiFact is an organization that does sort of fact checking of what politicians are saying. Uh, we're gonna become Vermont's PolitiFact partner. Um, and then we've also set up a growth fund which is sort of supposed to take uh, BT Digger to the next level um, to create a uh, What's the word for uh, a, a lasting fund? An endowment, there we go. Uh, <laughs> an endowment that uh, will sort of bring some stability to BT Digger and hopefully turn it into something more like an institution rather than being a startup. Um, yeah, so the website's btdigger.org. Uh, and thank you. <laughs>
Deeper Dig. Uh, the question was whether Deeper Dig is spelled with one G or two. Um, and then I was saying that it's also available, that podcast that I was speaking of, uh, if you look over on the right side of the homepage, you can find it there. We have a microphone system, so bear with us. Yeah, no problem. Um, during the uh, Ronald Reagan administration, I believe he either uh, by himself or through the Federal Communications uh, Administration eliminated what was called equal time. And that was uh, before cable news, cable TV. But it was designed to ensure that a program would have somebody on one side of the spectrum and somebody on the other side of the spectrum and have equal time. Either appearing on the same program or you know, back to back or something. What effect do you think that that has towards where we are today with you know, fake news and disinformation and partisan uh, Politics. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's it's a big question. Uh, it, um, I mean, I think a lot of news organizations still sort of uphold that principle because they don't want to be seen as partisan themselves. So, like, uh, if you look at um, BPR, uh, our coverage, you know, we. There's, I think, currently six candidates for governor in Vermont. You might not know that because a lot of them are independents. Uh, there's some sort of uh, Earth Party as well um, and the Liberty Bell Party. So we don't uh, admittedly give much coverage to those, the two independents and the others. But as far as Phil Scott and Christine Holquist, uh, it's important to us to cover both equally because we think that that is what makes readers trust us. So I guess for news organizations like us that are trying to give unbiased news, I would hope that they're upholding the same principle that the fairness uh, rule had. Um, it certainly allowed a lot of, I mean, it certainly give organizations the freedom to break with that trust and to pursue a partisan agenda, right? I mean, I don't think that, I mean, there are news organizations on both sides who uh, certainly see themselves as an arm of certain political philosophies as opposed to uh, sort of being in the public interest, I suppose. Um, you know, I guess personally, I, yeah, I mean, it's opened the way for much greater partisanship and political coverage. I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I think that there's probably strong debates to be made on both sides of that issue, whether or not the government should be dictating uh, to media outlets, what they cover. But. In the back. Oh, sorry, we'll take one from the front first. Uh, uh, I think you also have a spot on PBS. I usually yeah. miss it because it's just as I'm switching from the news on EPR to watching the evening news on PBS, and I sort of catch a Vermont TV. Uh, at that point. That's right. It's called the Digger Minute. It's once a week that our community editor, Mike Doherty, goes on and just sort of gives a rundown of a minute in the news. And they do the same thing with BPR once a week. Um, and I think it's an effort by Vermont PBS to just engage some of the other nonprofit news organizations and sort of, you know, create some sort of culture of collaboration between those organizations so that we're not all just doing our own thing. Yeah. It's great for us because then people like you who might not see VT, VT Digger online, uh, you know, become aware of us at the very least. So, yeah, well, I know. Um, you, if I understood you correctly, the, the uh, legislature adjournment, the, the, none of the daily newspapers had anybody there. And uh, I'm just wondering with the, the reduced news coverage, do you think that? has encouraged any misbehavior by public officials? I mean, do you think that they are uh, using that lack of scrutiny uh, to do things that they might not do if there was uh, more coverage? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the statewide level, there's still enough coverage and enough scrutiny that there's not a sense that nobody's watching. 
Uh, but there was a really interesting study that came out about a month ago about how um, in places, in these news deserts that I'm talking about, places that have lower news coverage, taxes are higher. Um, you know, that decisions, and there's, there's been some studies on accountability in other areas, such as corruption and that kind of thing, that just sort of shows that at a very local level, where there's little, literally no one covering it, that there is a direct relationship between that and decisions that might raise taxes, decisions that might uh, sort of create fuel unaccountability in some other ways. So I think that at the statewide level, you know, there's still up in the media box in the state house, there's still a few people watching. It's still clear that we're there. Uh, you know, whether or not, if there was literally no one there, would that sort of cause lawmakers to misbehave? I'm not so sure. But I think that, you know, it's probably more important at the granular level at select board meetings uh, or the lack of select board meetings because you can make decisions without any accountability whatsoever. So, um, yeah, I mean, I certainly think that there's a direct relationship there. Um, so, um, I noticed your demographic uh, numbers there. Uh, they skew highly to people like us in this room. That's right. Thank and you. And I wonder what are you doing about the population that gets almost all of their news from the internet, and um, how are you addressing that? Or is there another organization that, like you that they go to? Um, I think that's a very important thing for them to get news like you present. And do you have to, what do you do about that? Yeah, I mean, that's probably, uh, I would say, the most important question for us right now is how do we, you know, not, we're very happy to have high levels of readership among older populations, but we'd like that to be a bit more level, right? Um, and, I mean, one thing that we're doing is trying to engage more through social media. You know, that's not a very novel approach, but there's many different ways of how to do that. Uh, there's another thing called search engine optimization, which is using Google, essentially, and making sure that when people are searching for news about Vermont that they're finding BT Digger. Um, you know, you mentioned that w we're trying to, we're trying to engage with people who are getting their news online. We're an online only news outlet. It seems like those two things should go together fairly well. Uh, but so, you know, one question for us is to what extent are younger people reading the news at all? You know, uh, are they sort of engaging with national news and not really paying much attention to what's going on on a more local level? Um, you know, is it sort of, I, I think there's a lot of studies also showing that general engagement, I mean, if you just look at voting, the sort of, the turnout for voting is dropping drastically as well. So, you know, is it part of a more general trend of not caring that much about the decisions being made in the state? Uh, do we need to engage on an issues basis as opposed to, you know, a sort of broad coverage, not what people want, should we be focused more on you know, the clean energy movement and sort of try to focus on that. You know, there's a lot of questions that we're pursuing to try to answer that question um, of how do we get a younger demographic to uh, care about the stories we're telling? Or is it a way that we're telling the stories? You know, a lot of our stories we still tell mostly through typed words, right? That we often write 800 to 1,000 words about the issue of the day. Um, you know, should we be focusing our resources on trying to make videos that tell those stories? Um, should we have <coughs> just data graphics that tell it rather than trying to sort of tell it as a written narrative? Um, yeah, but you know, we're, we're all very used to that format, the written narrative, so that that's sort of what we're most comfortable producing. Um, shifting to something where we're telling all our stories in a video format or something like that uh, would be a huge decision for us. Um, and maybe it would, all the people who do appreciate what we're doing right now wouldn't want it in a video, right? So, you know, and then do we have the resources to do both? Can we do a video and print? And the answer to that probably right now is no. So, uh, great question, and let us know if you got any ideas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Could you, uh, could you speak about your experience in Cambodia and who you, uh, who you, you were a journalist there? writing for and was it in English and what was your most significant experience there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I started there, I taught for a year. I taught like six to nine year olds. I left right out of college. Uh, something to do. Um, and I, I hadn't been out of the country much so just sort of trying to broaden my horizons. 
Um, and then I started writing for the Phnom Penh Post, which is one of two of the major English language newspapers in Cambodia. The other one is the Cambodia Daily. Um, I started a, a weekly news magazine for Cambodians that was bilingual in Khmer and English. Uh, that was sort of meant to do something very similar to what you're talking about, which is tell the news in a way that younger people would want to read it, right? So uh, more pictures, uh, smaller sort of chunked stories rather than long stories, um, just trying to engage young folks. We had an online platform for debate, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I moved over to the Cambodia Daily. I became the politics reporter uh, during the 2013 election which was a very exciting election in Cambodia. The opposition was very strong. Um, the opposition leader came back from France a few weeks before the election. Uh, it was electric. Uh, the opposition had never been stronger. Um, they won almost half of the vote. Uh, the ruling party, so there were pro the ruling party declared that they won. There were mass protests throughout the city and I was covering those uh, tens, perhaps more than 100,000 people out on the streets at the same time. Um, so that was as far as the most interesting thing that I covered <laughs> that, at that period. Uh, you know, that certainly, I may never cover anything as exciting as that. Maybe not in Vermont, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to envision exactly what might uh, reach that level. Um, and then the ruling party declared victory. The protests died down a bit. The ruling party got very sort of heavy handed. Uh, over the past five years, it's sort of been a quickly deteriorating uh, landscape there. The opposition leader was put in jail. Uh, he was recently released to house arrest. Um, the media environment, the newspaper that I worked at, the Cambodia Daily, is closed now. Uh, they still do a bit of online stuff, but we had something like 40 staff members, including 20 journalists, and those jobs have all been lost. Uh, so the newspaper does not exist as a newspaper anymore. Um, our competitor was purchased by a friend of the prime minister and has been watered down very much. Um, so the media environment is really struggling. Uh, Voice of America and Radio Free Asia, which are both funded by taxpayers, uh, are sort of the most robust news organizations reporting on Cambodia. Um, and that's, you know, that's great, uh, although they don't quite do the sort of robust daily coverage that we were doing. Um, yeah, and then I moved back with my wife, Sue Kim, and our son, uh, in exactly a year ago, we went back to the States and moved to Vermont um, about nine months ago. Is that, is that enough? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about uh, how you have such good in-depth coverage on political matters and what's happening at the state capitol. <clears throat> I wonder if there's any way you can side that into doing something with C uh, WCAX. I understand <laughs> so that people are actually watching. Stuff, but I, there is, I, I'm just asking if there's a possibility you can find some opening there for that kind of uh, reporting because very well done. Thank you. Um, so Neil Goswami, who you probably recognize if you know CAX, uh, you know, he's a pretty great reporter and he knows what's going on. He, he, I mean, he's got a great understanding. He came from a print background. I don't know if you knew that. He worked for the Times Argus as well. Um, and he has talked to my colleagues uh, about just sort of TV as a medium just doesn't allow for in-depth storytelling. You know, it allows he gets like, he'll cover the state house for a day and he has to describe what happened in a minute and a half. You know? And it's like, how do, you, how do you really explain what's going on? So you know, I, I don't think for him at least, I, I don't think it's the quality of reporting, I think it's the decision being made by producers as far as how much time they want to give those things. Uh, so whether or not BT Digger could convince CAX, I mean, the other thing is they could do you know, like, uh, after this, I'm actually going to Vermont PBS to do Vermont This Week, right? Which is they, they choose to give a half hour of their programming just to talk about state politics. So if CAX felt like, you know, if they did something like that where they actually had, like, a, a Vermont politics show, that seems like that might be, but it doesn't seem like that's the direction they're moving in. You know, I think they're giving less and less time to what's going on in state politics. and. I'm sure that has to do, you know, they've, 
Uh, I describe what's going on in print media, but the same thing's happening to CAX. They've had a ridiculous number of layoffs in recent years, and they're a very diminished organization as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you said something about the stories that you covered. Can you tell me what, what do you define as the stories you would cover? Because uh, the example you use where you don't cover the other uh, candidates, you just cover the, the main ones. I mean, I would like to know about those other candidates. Yeah. And by covering only certain candidates, that gives them exposure and people don't even know about the others. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so people just kind of hear, hear their votes to the, those that are in the you know, sure, and and there's been I don't know. Do you know Charles Laramie? He's one of the independents running this year, um, but he's been very sort of forceful, sort of pushing this issue uh, that he should be getting equal coverage. I mean, and, and you know, I could probably it's quite a can of worms to open up to talk about this because the main reason we see is that if there are six, it's very easy to sign up. You need 500 signatures in Vermont, right? So if you can get 500 signatures, then you can enter the race. And then whether or not we're being unfair by not covering them, I think that you know, we're trying to give people information that will help them decide who will be Vermont's next governor. Um, so I don't know whether or not, nothing against the Earth Party, but I'm not sure that the Earth Party candidate has a chance at becoming Vermont's next governor. And do we want to give them one-sixth of the time or one-sixth of the space on our website because they managed to get on the ballot? And perhaps the answer is yes, but we also, you know, covering six campaigns takes a lot more resources than covering two campaigns. Um, we will do stories on the independent candidates before the election. Uh, we're including them in our voter uh, guide, which is a guide that you can go to to find out about every candidate in every race across the state. The way that we do that is we send emails to the candidates, ask them the same questions, basic questions, what are your stances on the sort of important policy issues of the day, tell us a bit about yourself, and then that information will all be available to our readers so that you can see whatever the six candidates have to tell you about their positions and who they are. Um, as far as our day-to-day -day news coverage of the campaign, um, it will continue to be focused mostly on those people, unless one of the independents. I mean, I think Bernie Sanders is a great example that if you, if you make, I mean, he went through so many elections where everyone was ignoring him, right? Like, I think he lost like 12 elections before he won one, something like that. So, I mean, if, you, if you're an independent candidate who turns yourself into part of the story, who's having campaigns, who has supporters, who's coming out and showing that you are part of the conversation, then both Digger and TV stations, everyone will start covering you, right? So, I mean, there's no clear answer, and I think that's part of the problem. And we've been talking this year about trying to come up with a coherent policy to say, we don't have the resources, nor do we think it's valuable to cover every person who's on the ballot. We will make sure that information about those candidates is available on our website for anyone who wants it. But here's how we're gonna cover the campaigns in a way that's both fair and allows people to sort of see the competition between the two people who, uh, by all accounts, seem to be the only real competitors <coughs> for who's gonna be from government. I don't know if that was satisfactory, but it, it's something that we're it's something that we're thinking a lot about, and I think it's a very fair question. Uh, if there's maybe one more question, yeah, I, uh, I this is something that's been on my mind. I I like watching uh, or reading on the internet uh, various news sources for my bigger but also uh, New York Times, Washington Post, other news organizations. Um, but I don't subscribe to these ones like New York Times. The New York Times and Washington Post and others limit you to a certain number of views per month. And of course, I violate that, like lots of people do, by deleting the cookies uh, and then go back on and, and just read this. So, okay, but what I, what, what I, I guess I'd like your comments, but I wish there was a way that you could put an umbrella organization or something, something like that, that, you know, for, to go to New York Times to read a few columns a month 
<coughs> it would be $150 a year or more. Um, I, that doesn't, doesn't fit, you know, and then I want to read watch the post again. Um, I wish there was something that I could go out to that would credit me um, so that I could give to them. I don't really, you know, in a reasonable way. Well, like a coalition of like 10 national news outlets that you could like, get a certain number of views Great idea. between all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of wish there was something else. I know there, a lot of these organizations are hurting, yeah. but those of us... Yeah, I mean, part of it is that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, right? And people need the subscribers and the idea of getting a few pennies from a subscriber who's buying 10 views a month across 10 websites is not going to help anyone's but revenue it, generation. But you know, but I think my argument <coughs> is, I'm not talking about a few pennies. If you look at the number of people that are going doing the same thing I'm doing across the nation, you would probably have tens of thousands, yeah. if not more. Then, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a fantastic idea. I, I support the idea, and I'll mention it to people when I meet them. <laughs> I was just wondering if you've ever heard of it. I mean, I, you know, I'll admit that I, you know, I subscribe only to the New York Times. That's like because I can afford to subscribe to about one website, so that's the one that I do. Uh, if that could give me some access to the Washington Post, I'd be much happier because then I could read both. But at the moment, it's choice for it. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Very much.